there. Hallelujah. Halle, halle, halle. done for 
for me. You don't know what he's done for me. Gave me the victory. Gave me the victory. I love him. I love him. I really love the Lord. Come on, let's try that. I really love the Lord. I really love the Lord. I really love, I really love the Lord. You don't know what he's done for me. You don't know what he's done for me. Come on, young folk, and lift your voice and say, gave me, gave me the big. I love it. I love it.
Now prepare for our responsive reading. It will also be on the screen behind me. 581 in the back of the hymnals, the Lord's Supper. And let us read a responsive. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Great is your faithfulness, O God, my Father, Lord, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not as thou hast been. Thou forever will be in the summer and the winter, in the springtime and the harvest, the sun, the moon, and the stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness. Yes, to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Oh, great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see and all i have needed thy hand have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. You give me pardon for my sin and the peace that endureth. And thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Lord, you give me strength for today and bright hope for every tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Oh, great is thy faithfulness. So great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, no mercies I see. And all I have needed, Lord, your hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, 
Lord, unto me, oh, grace, hey, thy faithfulness, so great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, no And all I have needed, Lord, 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 your hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, great is thy faithfulness, each and every day, great is Thy faithfulness, Lord, on to, to me, to me. Let us say amen. Let us say amen one more time. I want, if I can, read out of the contemporary English version. This passage. Verse 12, this translation says, I have not yet reached my goal. I am not perfect. But Christ has taken hold of me. So I keep on running and struggling to take hold of the prize. Verse 13, my friends, I don't feel that I've already arrived. But I forget what is behind. And I struggle for what is ahead. 14. I run forward towards the goal so that I can win the prize of being called to heaven. I want to talk to you today from the theme starting over. New Year and a fresh start. I, I want you, if you will, to say to somebody next to you, starting over, a new year and a fresh start. Come on, say it to somebody else. Starting over, a new year and a fresh start. Shall we bow? Shall we pray? Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, to the power of thy grace divine, let our soul look up the steadfast will, let our will be lost in thine. That is our prayer. Amen. Starting over, a new year and a fresh start. The epistle of Philippians is a wonderful book for you to begin in the new year because this epistle is an epistle that celebrates joy. I want to pause and say that the epistle of Philippians and this book that celebrates joy tells us that joy is not based on our circumstance, but it is based on our mindset. In other words, brothers and sisters, that if you're waiting for life to put you in 
some place that has something to do with some preconceived notion of some preconceived amount of money you need to have to have you in a position where you are living in a certain place, working a certain job in a certain circumstance. This book tells you that you don't have to wait until that happens, if it ever happens at all. But rather, you can have joy. Where you are. And if I might for a moment just share with you that never assume because you're in a certain place, joy is going to jump out on you. Doesn't matter where you are, does not matter what position you are in. I want you to know as this new year starts, God wants you to have joy. And the song says, this joy that I have, can I find half a witness? The world didn't give it to me, and the world cannot take it away. This epistle comes to us very powerfully because this church lived in a crooked and depraved generation. They were not economically, nor were they numerically in a position that one would have said would have given them joy. For if you were to read Acts 16, you would see that this church was started out of a prayer meeting in a jailhouse. That this church was started by a few women. And let me just start and say, brothers and sisters, that if we've been waiting on men to get together, we'd be in bad shape. Thank God the Bible says where two or three assemble in his name. He said, I will be in the midst. This group started in Act 16 in Ladea's House of Purple. And by and large, we find this was a small group of impoverished Christians who became the model of the New Testament church. Those who have been with us in Bible study have seen that Paul will speak to the church in Corinth and remind them in their wealth and in their position that they ought to be like this small poor church that have given everything because Paul says they first gave themselves to Christ. And so Paul writes to them and cannot dare tell you that Paul says to them that they ought to have joy and Paul is not in a privileged position himself. Paul is writing this epistle while he is in jail. I don't know about you brothers and sisters, but I don't know how many of us know how to praise God when life ain't working right. I hope you don't have to have your pockets full. I hope you don't have to have perfect health. I hope you don't have to have all your bills paid for you to be able to say God is still good. I hope there's somebody here this morning, no matter what circumstance you're in, that can say, I woke up this morning. Can I find a witness with my mind stayed on Jesus? I, I wonder, is there anybody here that can say no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you have to deal with in the new year, you can still say God is worthy to be praised. The songwriter says, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, God is worthy to be praised. The psalmist put it another way. He says that when we get to church, we ought not wait for the praise team or the choir to get us happy. But when we come to church, we ought to come to his gates. Is there a Bible reader here? We're to be in his sanctuary with praise. Why ought we praise God? We ought to praise the Lord because he's good. Oh, bless his name. 
If you've eaten every day, he's good. If he's kept clothes on your back, he's good. If he's watched over you despite you messing up as I have, God is good. Thus, we ought to praise God just simply because he's good. So the church is not in an idea situation. They're small. They're impoverished. Paul is in jail. But yet, he is able to say to this church, have joy. Now, let me pause right there and say that you ought to be able to encourage somebody no matter where you are. You don't always have to be looking over the mountains to be able to encourage somebody. You sometimes ought to be able to tell somebody what the Lord has done for you. Even, 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 even if the Lord has not done it, you ought to be like the three Hebrew boys and be able to say, even if God doesn't do it, I can praise God because he's able. Anybody here know he's able? Has the Lord ever made a way for you? I said he's able. Has the Lord ever opened a door for you? He's able. Somebody else said you don't have to wait till the battle is over. You ought to shout right now. Shout thanking God for what God is going to do. Paul is in jail and the church is poor and small, yet he encourages them to look at the model of Christ Jesus. Wow, that's wonderful. And, and, and what he says to them is that you ought not get too big to want to serve God. I'm going to say that one more time. Don't get so big. Don't get so rich. Don't get so prestigious. Don't become so sophisticated that you cannot serve God. Sometimes I'm wondering when I'm sitting there preaching, am I at a jazz concert? Because there are a whole lot of folk who sit and looking like a, a, a jazz critic. And rather than coming wanting to serve, they look like they come to survey. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and they come more with the spirit of Cisco and Eber that they want to see. They, 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 they don't understand that God has called us to serve. Yes. That it's not about how the preacher preaches. It's not about how the choir sings. It's about how willing are you to serve. Yes. The text says, the text makes it very clear that Paul says to them, look at Jesus. Who was God? Equal with God but thought it not robbery to become a servant. Can I get a witness? He said he was God, but when God needed God to save man, God did not tell God his pedigree. He didn't tell God where he had gone to school. He didn't tell God who he was. But rather, the text says, he became a servant. Matter of fact, the real word is not even servant, it's a slave. And we black folks know there's a difference between a servant and a slave. A servant can quit. I don't, I don't want to start off with a Richard Pryor joke, but you know Richard Pryor would get that joke, talking about the man in the field, talking about he'll quit. But see, servants can't quit. And when the Lord has called you, I don't think you heard me. When the Lord has put a fire on the inside, can I call Jeremiah this morning? You may not want to do it. You may not feel like going. You may not even feel that the folk receive it or respect you. But Jeremiah said it's like fire shut up in your bones. I know this morning the bed was feeling good. It was warm too. But when the Lord makes you think about how he kept you all last year from hurt, harm, and danger... And he said, you ought to come and tell me, thank you. He 
he became a slave. And he then says, because Jesus became a slave, a servant to God, God has given him a name. That is above every name. That the name of Jesus. Every knee must bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue must confess. You sitting looking at me wise and otherwise. But do you know I'm not going to wait till the last day for me to acknowledge who God is. Every knee. Every tongue. If the Lord has brought you this whole last 2014, you ought to not wait until the end day. You ought to tell the Lord, thank you right now. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we've already come. We come this far by faith and grace shall lead us on. But now bring me to this text this morning that then Paul begins to look at himself. And see, you ought to be able to go from Christ and folk ought to be able to look at you. And you become an image of Christ. Not just for the preacher, not just for the trustee, not just for the deacon. How is your image of Christ? The text says, Paul says, that I'm looking at what I've been able to achieve. Third chapter of Philippians is Paul's resume. He says, I am of the tribe of Benjamin. Goes on and tells them that I studied at the Harvard of this day. I sat at the feet of Gamel. I was a Pharisee. I am, he said, a Roman citizen. But when I think of Christ, I put all that stuff behind me. What am I trying to say to you this morning? I'm trying to tell you that when you get ready to go in 2015, you need to put some stuff. behind you that if you want to start over you can't carry all that baggage are you all getting warm I am if you want to have success in 2015 there's a lot of anger There's a lot of bitterness. There's a lot of judgment. There's a lot of uh, 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 resentment that can keep us from reaching the joy God has for us. And so Paul says to this church and to us, that before we can be the servants that God wants us to be, before we can live victoriously, we've got to learn how to discard some of the things that hold us back. Notice what he says. I am forgetting. That which is behind. If you want to reach your goal, my brothers and my sisters, you've got to figure out there's some things you've got to get rid of. You are going to help me today? Some folk have had a tough time in their life. Had a tough time on the job have had some bad experiences with their children. But you've got to figure out if you're going to move forward, you've got to get rid of 
some of this stuff. All this doubt. All this lacking of faith. All this low self-esteem. All this laziness. Discontentment. Negativity. If you did not leave it on the altar on watch night, I'm telling you right now, you ought to take it to the altar and know that if you want to move forward, you've got to get rid of some of this stuff. I'm forgetting those things which are behind. And then he says, you've got to have a goal. You get loose and don't have a goal, you'll get more mess. Jesus said, man had demons, he cleaned the room. But he didn't fill it with anything. And demons worse than the first demon came and moved right back in that space. What am I telling you? I'm telling you that until we get a goal and learn how to leave the past in the past. Uh, Y'all going to help me today? See, if you go around and you clean out a space in your life and don't fill it up with a goal and Jesus Christ, the devil will fill that space and make you worse than you were before. Don't you empty space and start watching reality TV. No, no, no. Don't you empty space and stay on Facebook. You got to empty that space and develop a goal and know that you got to reach for a lofty height. Question I want to ask you this morning, what are your objectives. In 2015, when you start over, what do you want to reach for? You can't hit a bullseye until you first identify a bullseye. We ought to be telling our young children not to just do all right. We ought to be telling them they ought to reach for all A's. You tired of boss mistreating you? You ought to have an objective to do better on the job. You're tired of not working for other folk? You ought to set an objective this year that you want to start working for yourself. You want to quit having turmoil in your life? You ought to set an objective and say in your life, in your home, in your mind, that you want peace. You ought to set an objective and affirm your goal. Paul says, I'm forgetting those things which are behind and I'm setting a lofty goal. Yeah. Yeah. Can I pause and tell you, is your goal worthy of Christ Jesus? Well. Is this just going to be another year that comes in and goes out and you've not set a goal? You may be retired, but you still need a goal. You may be old, but you still need a goal. You may not have the money you like to have, but you still need a goal. You may be single, but you still need a goal. And I'm telling you today that if you just sit around and don't set some goal for your life, you're tired of being broke, you ought to set a goal to get on a budget. You're tired of all your money going out on bills? You ought to set a budget and say, I'm going to figure out how. I'm going to pay off this bill, pay off that bill, and then put myself in position that I can save and give something to the Lord. You want to lose some weight? You can't eat every Twinkie, get big bags of chips, you got to set a goal. I want to lose so much weight. Now, don't you go try to buy pills that tell you you don't have to do nothing. 
that tell you it's in your genes, but you've got to set a goal and work for that goal and set it before you and realize that if God be with you, I wish I could get a witness in here. I said, if God be for you, who can be against you? Set a goal. Forget those things which are behind. And then Paul says, I'm not perfect. Many of us have failed to reach goals because we failed to remember that God didn't make any of us perfect. Then why are you judging other people? Why are you pointing fingers at what they've done? It's going to get warm in here in a minute. There are always some fingers pointing back at you. And can I pause and tell you that if you want forgiveness, you better learn how to forgive. Because the Bible says the same measure that you judge other people God is judging you. You're not perfect. Don't you give up on yourself. Don't you lose hope in your ability to move forward simply because mistakes have been made. When you begin to look and set your goal, acknowledge the fact that I made some faults. Don't blame everybody in everything. You have some failures. The fragility of life means that we are human. And the reality is if we had life to live over again, many of us would do some things very differently. And there are a lot of things we would never do at all. We have fractures in the human experience. Paul says, I've made mistakes. And the reality is, you've made mistakes. You've got some idiosyncrasies and some frailties that you have to own up to. And acknowledge that you may be the problem. Acknowledge my spending, my thinking, my Arrogance, my selfishness may be my problem. But can I tell you, when you bring it to God, God is able. Can I get a witness in here to help you where you are? All you have to do is say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee, no other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, oh, whether shall I go? Somebody said, bring your problems to the Lord and leave them there. Cast your cast on him, for he careth for you. Can I tell you, he's able. Somebody here don't believe it. I said, he's able to pick you up. He's able to turn you around. He's able to change your heart. He's able to give you forgiveness. I said he's able. Anybody here know he's able? He's able. Yes, he is. So you got to unhinge some of the mess. The number one problem with black people is not racism, it's anger. We mad all the time. We bitter all the time. 
I know some folk, they got a frown on their face when they sleep. They gonna wake up mad, cause something not right. Go to bed man, something not right. But if you keep your mind on Jesus, and if you see your thoughts, and remember that God looks beyond all your thoughts. Oh help me somebody. You're not perfect. I know you want me to think you are. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. God looked beyond all our thoughts and saw our knees. So though you don't want to move, you don't want to get stuck, and you want to start over, you got to get rid of some of the baggage. You got to take responsibility for some of your actions. Sometimes you've empowered people to take advantage of you. You loan them money that you know they ain't gonna pay back. Help me, Holy Spirit. You let them live in the basement and not pay rent. You pay car notes and they got more cable stations than you. Your baby said too much. Well, they out with no good folks. If we don't empower, we enable them. By giving them too much time to get in trouble. My mother would say, the young girls that had babies, she said to the mother, don't you do too much babysitting, they'll come up with another one. Let her bring those kids. Because if he can't get used to the kids, he won't get used to her. Sometimes we got to get busy. Sometimes we got to play broke. Sometimes we got to act like we're not home. Sometimes we can't answer the phone. Sometimes we can't always say yes. Sometimes we got to let folks stand on their own two feet and fall and deal with the consequences of falling that when they make their bed, they learn they have to lay in it. There are folk, there are folk who say I forgive, but I ain't gonna forget. But let me tell you something, if you don't forget, that means you've not really forgiven. My Bible tells me that when we pray, God cast our sins in the sea of forgiveness. And he remembers it no more. And the Bible says, far as the east is from the west the Lord will forgive it will remember it rather no more and that tells me that uh, in this forgetting of the past those who want to succeed in marriage those who want to succeed in their relationship with family and friends those who want to succeed in school and those in the church that want to move forward, we've got to forget what Cain Avenue was when Herman Watts was pastor, when Dennis Thomas was pastor, when people live in the neighborhood. And remember the song that says that we must serve God in this present age. Our calling to fulfill. You've got to forget how life was in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, and began to assume the right now and say, Lord, I'm looking for new mercies every day. I'm expecting a miracle, knowing that God can make a way out of no way. So after you get rid of the 
baggage of the past. Let me pause when I say that. You can almost go back to the doctor and get rid of some of those blood pressure pills. When you get rid of the baggage of the past. Whatever you have not been, God has given you a fresh start. May not have been a good father, but you can be a good father now. May not have been a good wife, you can be a good wife now. May not have been a good mother, you can be a good mother now. God has given you another chance, a fresh start, a new beginning, to have a fresh lease on life. Paul says, I press. I'm closing now. This is the language of one who runs. That when you see a runner winning, at the last moment, usually there's only tenths of seconds between first and second. And Paul uses the language that says, I'm reaching with all my energy. I'm reaching with all my ability to get the high calling which is in Christ Jesus. And that's what I'm saying to you, my brothers and my sisters. I'm optimistic about 2015. I'm not worried about yesterday. I'm thanking God for today. I'm looking for a miracle. I know God will make a way out of no way. I'm looking for higher ground. Somebody said I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. 